but welcome everyone. My name's Gabrielle Liu, um, and today we're going to be talking about hindrance or help, risks of student monitoring and disproportionate discipline. Uh, and now I am representing the organization Educating All Learners Alliance, and we're really happy to have a few of our partner organizations speak here um, as panelists on this topic. So to give you an overview of the discussion, um, we're going to go through both CDT and NCLD, what the organizations are, what their work focuses on, but then of course, diving into that, um, you know, disproportionate discipline topic. And then if we have time, um, we will be able to answer any questions if you have any from the chat. So feel free as we go through to add any questions in the chat and then we'll answer those at the end. But just to share a little bit about the Educating All Learners Alliance initially. Um, so as I mentioned, these are partner organizations. Um, so the Educating All Learners Alliance, E-A-L-A, -A, which we like to call ELA, is a coalition of um, organizations representing schools, um, policy organizations, nonprofits, various organizations across the sector, um, all coming together to support students with disabilities by curating uh, a resource library, creating resources like this webinar and a podcast, um, and hoping to promote best practices so that educators can use them in the classroom and um, help our students the best way possible. And so yeah, like I said, we're really happy to share with you today but I want to go ahead and quickly introduce our panelists. So you'll see we'll have Elizabeth Laird, who is the Director of Equity and Civic Technology at CDT. We also have Hugh Grant Chapman, who's the Research and Communications Associate of Equity and Civic Technology at CDT. And then we also have Lindsay Kubatsky, who's the Director of Policy and Advocacy at NCLD. And I will go ahead and kick it over to the CDT team to take it away. Great. Uh, so, as Gabby said, I am Elizabeth and I represent the Center for Democracy and Technology and we are a very proud member of ELA. Um, and the last time that we presented on a webinar, we were actually bringing really good news about um, uh, teachers who are working with students with disabilities and we had done some surveying and showed that they actually are, are better, smarter, having more conversations about privacy. So in a space that doesn't always have good news, we were really excited to, to bring that. Um, today, it's gonna maybe not be as great a news, but um, it's important to acknowledge where um, there are challenges so that we can work um, on them together. So um, uh, I work at the Center for Democracy and Technology, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that's been around for about 27 years, um, around the start of the internet, back when the internet was you know, on a CD and came in the mail. Um, and we were founded because there was you know, obviously tremendous potential for um, this new technology to do a lot of good in our lives, but also recognizing that we needed to be just as obsessed with making sure it doesn't come at the expense of people's rights. And so that's sort of the, the ethos of where we work is, is believing deeply in data and technology and being just as obsessed with privacy and making sure there aren't unintended consequences, which you know, really led us to your, your screen today. Um, and so what my colleague Hugh is gonna talk about is some research that we've done specifically around student activity and monitoring software. Um, and just to give you some context, we started looking at this issue because like all of you, um, you know, our lives changed overnight when the pandemic hit. In the case of schools, you know, we saw this incredible um, uh, proliferation of giving out school issue devices, which was so important. We all saw the, the pictures of uh, students doing homework in fast food parking lots because they didn't have you know, reliable Wi-Fi. But we, were, we wanted to know, well, what, what are the strings that have come attached to that? Are there any, any unintended consequences that we wanna be looking at? So specifically, we looked at um, uh, what students were being tracked on, how they were being tracked, when it was happening, and what we're gonna share with you today. So all of that, as you will talk about, is available on our website, but we're gonna specifically focus on parents of students with disabilities and teachers who are working with students with disabilities and how um, uh, this has the potential to really contribute to what is, already a, an issue of disproportionate discipline. So with that, I will turn it over to Hugh to get into the, the exciting stuff. Um, and if you have any questions about CDT or anything else, feel free to drop them in the chat. Awesome, thank you, Elizabeth. And we'll stay on this slide for just a little bit longer here. Um, so as, as Elizabeth mentioned, the past few years, we've seen an increase in schools reliance on all kinds of data and technology for a range of functions. And that has included 
technology use for school discipline purposes. Uh, we've seen a concerning number of stories in the past few years that highlight these concerns, which uh, some of these headlines uh, from the past couple of years illustrate. What ties these stories together is that each relies on uses of technology in schools that would not have been possible 10 or 20 years ago. These are novel use cases and they're raising important questions about student privacy. One technology that's been especially relevant, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, um, in these discussions of disciplinary tech in schools is student activity monitoring software. Um, so student activity monitoring software is a kind of technology that tracks students' activity online. Um, and this can include uh, things like monitoring search queries, browsing history, messaging and social media interactions, um, as well as real-time tracking of the contents of student screens. Um, often we've seen this functionality is not limited to school hours. Uh, so as you see here, uh, we did some research and found that um, according to our research, 81% of teachers report that their school uses uh, student activity monitoring software. And of these teachers, almost half of them indicate that it is used at least in part to identify student violations of disciplinary policy, which is a very large number that caught us by surprise and really put this on our radar for something we should be paying attention to for potential uh, ramifications. So we can hop on over. So a major part about why we care about this and why we're talking about it in the context of students with disabilities is because this is an equity issue. There's a long-standing track record of inequitable disciplinary decision-making in schools. And research has shown that students with disabilities are disciplined by school authorities at higher rates than other students. Our concern here is that disciplinary use of tech and data in schools risks magnifying these inequities um, by increasing potential touch points with disciplinary authorities. So CDT's research examines these risks um, by, you know, in this case, we're gonna talk about some survey research that we did. Um, we conducted nationally representative uh, surveys of teachers and parents of K through 12 students um, with the goal of understanding this issue. Uh, we wanna understand the attitudes of those who are most proximate to providing specialized care for the student population. Um, so for each of these data points below, we contrast the responses of teachers who are specifically responsible for providing educational services to students with disabilities versus uh, teachers who are strictly uh, general education teachers. And similarly, we contrast the responses of parents of students who use IEPs or 504 plans versus parents of those who do not. So let's get into it here. Um, we found that teachers of students with disabilities are more likely than other teachers to express concern about the risks of data use related to discipline or punishment. Uh, the chart here shows this contrast across a couple of different discipline related questions that we surveyed teachers about, uh, which include, which are related to sharing student data with law enforcement and using student data for certain predictive purposes related to discipline. Part of why these use cases are potentially concerning is due to the risk of embedding systemic biases that adversely impact students with disabilities into data that is then related to disciplinary decision making. Uh, cool. um, advancing on to parents here, uh, when asked similar questions, we see the same kind of contrast play out in parents of students with IEPs or 504s versus parents of students who do not use those. Um, so specifically, uh, parents of students with IEPs or 504s are more likely than other parents to express concern about the risks of data use related to discipline or punishment. I'll point out here that these differences are pretty large. They're about you know, 20 percentage points each, um, which really, uh, really kind of illustrates how big of a disconnect between these populations of parents. You can go next slide. So we surveyed some specific questions about student activity monitoring software, as we mentioned earlier. We were surprised to see that parents and teachers of students with disabilities were actually more likely than other parents and teachers to report that the benefits of using student activity monitoring software outweigh its risks. Uh, so as I said, this was a little surprising to us, and it's one area that we hope to investigate further in future research. Uh, one hypothesis that we discussed uh, with other experts is that given the higher rates of bullying or unfair treatment the students with disabilities often face from other classmates, 
Parents and teachers of these students may view student, student activity monitoring software as a way to shine a light on issues these students face and bring more transparency to their school experiences. Um, so this is just one hypothesis. Uh, and as we'll see in a second, it doesn't negate the point that parents and teachers of students with disabilities um, have uh, the, po the point that these parents and teachers have some substantive concerns about the use of this kind of software. Um, but it definitely suggests that further research is needed to understand what, what might be going on here, what might be behind these views. So as it says here, you know, the point we just made notwithstanding, we found that parents and teachers, both of students with disabilities, show particular concern about disciplinary uses of monitoring software. Specifically, we asked both parents and teachers uh, whether they agree that student activity monitoring software could bring long-term harm to students if it is used to discipline them or share out of context. Uh, so in this chart here, the light blue bars show the views of teachers and parents of students with disabilities, uh, respectively, and then the dark blue bars show the views of other teachers and parents. Um, so again, for, for both teachers and parents, the contrast that you see here is pretty striking. Um, so kind of just to like pull it together for a sec, across all these data points, the findings tell a pretty consistent story, um, which is that teachers and parents of students with disabilities show elevated levels of concern about disciplinary uses of school technology when compared with other teachers and parents. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth, uh, talk a little bit about what some of these findings might mean and some recommendations. Great. Thank you, Hugh. Um, so just to, just to summarize, I think um, the top line here is that um, there are concerns across the board for certain uses of monitoring what students are doing. Um, and that we saw those concerns were heightened among parents of students with disabilities and teachers working with students with disabilities. Um, and so for us, we've been thinking about, well, what, what can the field do about this? Um, so one thing that Hugh didn't talk about is that one of the drivers behind adopting these kinds of technologies is um, the view that by monitoring what students are saying um, and doing that that can actually help keep students safer. So if a student um, in uh, a Google Doc uh, writes something about wanting to harm themselves or someone else that these algorithms will, will pick that up. Um, but as we just talked about, you know, this technology can also have a, a pretty detrimental effect on certain groups of students. Um, including students with disabilities. And so the first recommendation here is that when you're talking about student safety, you should start with a holistic definition that also includes um, mitigating any disproportionate effects of discipline and law enforcement that would you know, address these potential unintended consequences for students with disabilities. And so that starting point is really important that it's not just about you know, preventing acts of self-harm, but you know, these are other ways that could actually you know, endanger the various students you're trying to keep safe. Um, the second point that we found is that a lot of time communities don't even know this is going on. Um, this isn't specific to just parents of students with disabilities, but one in four parents said they don't even know if this software is being used on their child's device. Um, so schools uh, really should do a better job of being transparent and engaging communities, you know, if, if they're choosing to use this. Um, and, and having them have a seat at the table of, you know, if this is, if this is intended to make students safer, is it actually doing that? And how can we mitigate some of these concerns? Um, the third thing to do is just minimize, and this goes across the board, but you, know, you wanna minimize any kind of technology that's going to exacerbate discrimination or, or um, you know, uh, achievement gap or any, you know, any kind of disproportionate negative effects. And that certainly extends to this technology. So being really deliberate, you know, when you use it, how you use it, if you use it, um, is gonna be really important. And if you do use it, um, you know, the companies are, are very forthcoming in saying, hey, this is not for disciplinary purposes. Um, you know, you could have a policy that says we will never use this for disciplinary purposes. Uh, but my, in my experience, having worked in states, it's, you know, sometimes you have the data, you start to have a system and like, oh, now that we have it, it would be cool to use it for this other thing. So unless you're really deliberate and intentional and thinking ahead, um, you could find yourself using something that's not intended for discipline for disciplinary purposes. Um, the fourth point, uh, which we didn't get into as much here, but um, these uh, programs are almost all done by third parties. So it's not just schools having this information, it's also about companies collecting it on their behalf. 
Um, so it's really important that schools maintain control of that data because just in hearing you talk about it, it's very sensitive um, and, and you know, could be used in ways that could really limit opportunities. Um, and then finally, like this is, you know, this is an emerging technology. It's not something that, you know, has been around for that long. It certainly wasn't around when CDT was founded or when some of these requirements were put in place. Um, so it's really important that within schools, they build their own capacity to engage on these conversations and understand it's not just the benefits of monitoring students, but there also are some real risks and how do they think about that and evaluate whether this product is really right for them. Um, and I hope uh, for those of you who are in schools or for those of you who are working with them that um, we've made the case that they don't come without a cost. They can actually hurt the various students you're trying to help, especially if it's being used for disciplinary purposes. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, my very esteemed colleague at NCLD. I noticed our, our names, our acronyms kind of rhyme, CDT, NCLD. Uh, so I don't know if that was planned, but um, uh, here's where you can read more about uh, this issue. There's a ton of more research that we did not get into um, there, but I'll turn it over to Lindsay and I'm looking forward to hearing um, what NCLD thinks about these issues. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth, and thanks you. Um, really uh, incredible survey findings and and ones in which the disability community and the civil rights community has been uh, thinking about for a while in terms of equity and, and making sure that we're, we're meeting the needs of students and keeping them safe. So um, again, hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Kabatsky. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the National Center for Learning Disabilities. And I just wanted to talk a little bit more from the disability rights perspective about some of the potential benefits and risks for students with disabilities. But first I wanted to uh, mention uh, who we are in CLD. Um, our mission is to improve the lives of the one in five children and adults who struggle with learning and attention issues. And when we say learning and attention issues, we often uh, interchange that with learning disabilities or students with ADHD. So this refers to a group of students uh, with specific disorders that can negatively impact learning. Um, so this could be areas of development such as speaking, uh, thinking, reading, writing, spelling, or doing math. Um, one of the most prevalent types of learning disabilities is in the area of reading and literacy, and it's often called dyslexia. So we advocate on behalf of students with dys dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, and those identified as having ADHD. Um, currently, there's a little over 2 million students who are classified as having an LD and receive special education services in schools. Um, so this is about 40% of all school-age students with disabilities. Um, uh, roughly uh, another 15% of students receiving special education are under the uh, are identified as uh, under the other health impairment category, which is where a lot of students who have ADHD are typically classified. So just that for a little background on the population that we serve, we wanted to talk a little bit about why parents and educators of students with disabilities might be more likely to support the student monitoring software. So as Hugh was mentioning, there is disproportionate um, discipline and harassment and bullying for students with disabilities. So the students that we serve, uh, those identified as having SLD are 31% more likely than their peers without disabilities to uh, being uh, bullied. Uh, those students under other health impairment have 43% more like, uh, are 43% more likely than those without disabilities to experience high levels of being bullied. So you can imagine that parents are acutely aware that their students are at risk of being harassed or bullied in school and um, are particularly vulnerable to, to some of these uh, things that uh, we're worried about when we think about school safety. In addition, as Hugh was saying, um, students with disabilities have disproportionate rates of harsher discipline. So 80% of the students who are subjected to physical restraint or seclusion are students with disabilities. Um, 70, sorry, 80% of physical restraint, 77% uh, were subjected uh, to seclusion were students with disabilities. And in terms of suspension, this is especially um, worrisome that um, one in four boys of students with disabilities who are of color are suspended and one in five girls uh, who are of color receive an out of school suspension. So it's a really um, important thing that we're, we're thinking about here when we talk about equity and school monitoring is that um, our students are more likely to be bullied, harassed, but also more likely to be disciplined, secluded, restrained in harsh uh, ways. And so um, parents are obviously 
uh, really concerned about the safety of their students, particularly if their student is um, a student of color as well as a student with disability. So um, if you go on to the next slide, you can see that some parents have actually pushed for technology to monitor students inside the classroom. Um, this is often because of abuse by educators. So this is an example of uh, my home state in Texas uh, where uh, Burleson parents advocating for advocated for putting cameras inside of classrooms with uh, students who uh, were nonverbal, and um, these student or these uh, parents wanted cameras in there because um, they were accusing their uh, educators of uh, abusing their their children. So this included pinching their armpits, cupping their mouths when they were crying, or uh, ridiculing them, and so. You, Parents really want what's best for their child, and, and part of that means keeping them safe in school. And so if there's a way in which technology can help do that, I think it's uh, pretty apparent that parents want that um, in, inside their, their school system that their students with disabilities particularly are, are being subjected to. On the flip side, why would parents and educators of students with disabilities also be more concerned, as Hugh and Elizabeth were talking about, about some of this student monitoring software? So there's two uh, specific reasons why students, uh, parents and educators of students with disabilities would be um, concerned about this. Uh, the first one is imprecision um, uh, with the algorithms uh, that we might use to identify a student as being a threat to school safety. So um, I think Elizabeth gave a, a similar example, but an algorithm might flag when a student types the word kill, even if it's saying, I'd kill for that soda. Um, so you can imagine when there would be opportunities for an algorithm to flag a student as being a threat when in fact they are um, making a joke or you know, using a, a phrase that uh, is, is not really a threat, but could be identified as one. The other uh, op uh, opportunity for potential risks of having this school monitoring software is staff uh, being not able to identify behavior that is dangerous when in fact it's being caused by a disability. So this is often uh, occurs when students uh, have disabilities that impact their behavior, such as autism, or if they're identified as having an emotional disturbance. And so um, these are often misunderstood, both in, in school, in classrooms, but also we've seen a lot of that um, recently with law enforcement interactions with uh, individuals with disabilities. And so um, it, it can really cause a misunderstanding that can be um, detrimental to the student uh, with a disability or the individual with a disability. Uh, one example, if you go on to the next slide, is out of Oregon when a, um, a team of a threat assessment team identified a student with autism as being a threat to the school. Um, he exhibited behaviors that were um, aligned to his disability. So he, um, you know, he wore a heavy coat because it made him more, feel more comfortable when he was in school. He uh, wasn't as sociable as some of his peers. And so um, he was required to be under discreet supervision. Uh, he had to check in and out of school. He wasn't allowed to bring scissors to, to school. Um, his locker was opened and randomly searched by school administrators. Um, he was followed. Um, and all of these things made him feel like he was harassed in school and ultimately not able to learn. And so he left public school. And so that's a really critical issue that um, we need to be aware of when we're thinking about monitoring students and determining whether they're a threat because they are a legitimate threat to themselves or to their peers, or if they're simply exhibiting behaviors that are manifestations of their disabilities and are not actually a threat to anyone. And finally, um, the next slide talks a little bit about some of the other civil rights concerns that we've heard from our partners in the civil rights community. And this includes both um, organizations that represent students with disabilities, but also organizations that represent students of color. And so there is a potential of profiling children due to the, due to the child's demographics, their characteristics, or, or what they've historically done. And this profile can um, carry with them throughout their school uh, uh, career, but also can be uh, 
um, sent to law enforcement and have that as a part of their personal record um, that, that uh, is, is a part of them even after they, they leave school. Another thing that we're concerned about is that um, this type of monitoring could uh, bypass what's legally required under special education law. And so um, in order to suspend a student with a disability or otherwise discipline them, uh, you need to make sure that the behavior is not a manifestation of their disability, but rather um, a legitimate behavior issue that, that needs to be addressed. And so if you start monitoring students with disabilities without going through that uh, manifestation determination, it, it bypasses what um, disability rights groups have long fought for um, in the federal policy arena. Like I mentioned earlier, we can also, there's also a potential that we're referring students with disabilities to law enforcement when in fact, um, we need to be providing them with additional support and um, resources because of their disability and how they're interacting with their peers. And finally, um, there's a, if we're monitoring uh, students, we, there's a potential for um, you know, getting into implications related to a student's dis, uh, immigration status or um, you know, their relationship with their parents and who has custody and some of their public benefits that um, might be infringed upon if we go down this rabbit hole um, too far. So those are just a few of the concerns that um, our partners in the disability policy space and the civil rights policy space have. But there's uh, a few things that we can do to sort of mitigate some of those concerns. Um, in particular, we can be careful and inclusive of the types of systems that we implement. So the first thing is to include students with disabilities, their families, their educators, in any new initiative that we uh, are creating. So the people that know what some of these risks are and concerns are, are students with disabilities themselves. And so they are experts on their behavior and what might be perceived as a potential threat and what might, might not be. And so it's really important to get feedback from the community that we're seeking to protect. Um, and so that means having an ongoing relationship with uh, students with disabilities, their families and their educators as we implement any school safety initiative. Another thing we, uh, we can do is start with a universal screening process early on that includes academic behavior, social emotional functioning that's embedded with a multi-tiered system of support. And so if we're providing these resources at the uh, initial stage, if we're screening these students early on, um, there's, it's more likely that we're able to identify potential opportunities where a student might um, be a threat to themselves or a threat to others, and we can address that in a positive way and not a punitive or dis, uh, result in disciplinary action that could ultimately lead to um, a law enforcement refer referral. Finally, uh, another thing we can do is to create and normalize opportunities for counseling and mental health supports. There's been uh, a, a wave of uh, mental health initiatives that have gone on, especially in light of COVID when a lot of uh, students and, and students with disabilities have experienced trauma and isolation. And one thing we can do is support them with mental health supports and counseling and uh, make sure that they have access to school psychologists, school counselors, school social workers, and all the support staff that we know can provide um, really great resources to students and especially our students who are most vulnerable, such as uh, students with disabilities. And finally, we need to make sure that our educators and other school uh, administrators and school staff in the building understand how a disability may impact behavior. So we need to be able to recognize when a student is exhibiting behavior because of their uh, disability and not because they might be a potential threat to themselves or others. And we need to understand how to best address that behavior in a way that's inclusive and uh, recognizing the student um, fully and as uh, an individual with a disability in, in the most inclusive way possible. So those are just a few things that um, we think can, can be addressed and, and sort of mitigate some of the concerns that uh, civil rights community and disability rights community members have about some of this school monitoring support. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, turn it back over to you, Gabby.
Thank you. So I'll leave it on this next step slides, but I don't want to wrap things up just yet. Um, I think you both, both teams touched on some really excellent points. And I'd love, um, if you wouldn't mind, if you have any insights for those who may not know, what are some commonly used monitoring softwares? Like, is it as simple as putting a camera up in a classroom or, you know, what are some of those most frequently used monitoring systems? open to, to anyone. Yeah, um, I can talk about sort of how we define it. I'll start broader and then I can name some names. Um, so and when Hugh talked about student activity monitoring software, I think we care less about is it a standalone function or is it being done through an existing educational program? Um, and it can happen in both. But for what we're talking about are essentially algorithms that they're called natural language processing tools, which just means like they're searching for words and trying to analyze um, analyze language. Um, and uh, that can happen either in standalone products that schools will, will procure because they want to keep track of what students are doing and make sure that they are not at risk. Um, some of that tracking can actually happen through other programs too. So it, it's important to know that that tracking can happen in a few places. Um, but the standalone products, some, some ones that have gotten, you know, some media coverage are um, uh, GoGuardian is a really prominent one, um, Gaggle, Securely, and Bark um, are products that, that school districts are, are buying and installing on school issue devices or when students are logged into their school accounts. Uh, but these are algorithm based and they're trying to look at words and, and to Lindsay's point, look for words like kill and then try and assess um, you know, is it, you know, someone saying they want a soda or is it someone actually making threatening language and then what do they do with that? Um, that was the main thing that we focused on. There are other kinds of tracking tools, but in terms of our presentation, that was the one we're talking about. Yeah, and that was a good example on Lindsay's end because a lot of, you know, um, jokes within American language would be really bad in that situation. So it's really good to, to call that example out specifically. Um, and now I feel like you all alluded to it, um, but maybe not as directly pointed out the side of the sort of ed tech vendor or, you know, the companies that are providing these softwares. I just wanted to touch on that. I think it's an excellent point to, for them to consider the data and information that they're using on behalf of these districts to ensure that if it's a um, you know, like a learning management system that provides insights for teachers to use to ensure that the data collected isn't reflecting certain pieces of information that might inform that disproportionate action. Yeah, I mean, because these are algorithms and I don't know how familiar folks are, um, but you know, especially when they're held by third parties, they're like a black box. You don't know <laughs> what's going into them, um, what they're looking for, how they weight it. Sometimes you don't even know, is there like a line of human review or are those just things just being, you know, sent to back to schools? There's not always a lot of transparency into that. So something that we've been talking about with, with the companies that make them is, is to make that kind of information public um, and do, do analyses to see, are you disproportionately flagging any groups of students, which would include students with disabilities? Um, and in other cases, we know that you know, at sort of you're like outside of the norm in any way, you're going to be disproportionately affected by these things. Um, and so, you know, uh, and they don't always work on other languages. They don't always work on like emojis or videos. So there's there's a you know a lot of problems. But just being transparent about it and like looking for what we're suggesting could be a problem, which is that these aren't performing the same on all groups of students. Um, and then similarly, you know, this webinar is focused on discipline. These companies, as part of their terms of service, if they're saying this is for mental health purposes, they could say, you know, basically by using our product, you agree to not use this for discipline purposes. So there is a role that they could be more proactive about preventing what I think, you know, we heard pretty, pretty clearly is a concern, you know, among not just the, the disability community, but across the board, this was the top concern among all of the parents and teachers and students we asked was that this information would be used out of context and to discipline kids. Just to build on that, I think it's it's important to be transparent, but also proactive in, in, in reaching out to your, your parents and your students about how this software is used and, and making sure that like uh, 
there's a clear understanding between parents and the school system about what this is being used for and, and how, um, how they're gonna try to mitigate some of that disproportionate um, identification of students of color or students with disabilities. And I think you both answered a good question for any educators who, like you mentioned, may not know the software is being used, similar to how parents may not know. Um, and so that kind of, those examples of commonly used softwares will give educators an opportunity to ask their school admin or their district if it is being used. And then of course, how you can go about um, ensuring it's used to the right ability and capacity. I also just lastly wanted to touch on, um, Lindsay, your point about the mental health and kind of that proactivity of ensuring that mental health is cared for to prevent any um, you know, discipline from arising unnecessarily. I think that's a, an excellent point. Um, and just ensuring that educators and schools are, are well-trained um, to mitigate these risks is, is really good. Now, I'd love if you could both maybe wrap up by sharing where people can go to know more about each of your organizations. Um, yes, before we do that, Gabby, if it's okay, um, on the topic of mental health, um, I wanted to see if you could, we didn't, we didn't talk about this research in this presentation, but we focus on discipline because that's what the topic was. But uh, I'd love to take just one minute to also talk about the impact of these surveillance tools on students' mental health, including students with disabilities, because we were really surprised uh, to hear um, how it affected students if they knew they were being monitored. Yes. No, please yeah. do. I think there's a clear correlation between how, you know, certain actions because of mental health might then result in this disproportionate discipline. So yeah, please do share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one thing that we looked at, as, as Elizabeth mentioned in uh, this research, and you know, we plan to do future research on, is uh, the impact of the awareness of the uh, student behavior is being monitored on those students' mental health, specifically in the form of uh, what we call a chilling effect. Um, and what we mean by that is um, we found in our surveys polling students um, that students who are aware they're being monitored and uh, surveilled by student activity monitoring software are less likely to express that um, they are willing to share their true thoughts or feelings online um, and are more likely to uh, yeah, essentially that, less likely to share their uh, true thoughts or feelings. Um, and our sort of like point of concern on that is that there are adverse kind of mental health um, implications for having to uh, self-censor and sort of like self-police uh, your online, uh, online rhetoric and presentation. Um, so that's just something that we are also paying attention to. We are looking forward to doing more research on that. But I think that um, certainly, again, I think it's relevant here seeing these kind of risks of disproportionate impact on students with disabilities, um, that that is a salient concern uh, for that community. And Gabby, you could imagine that a, a student with a communication disorder or a, uh, a student that um, their disability impacts their, their way in which they interact with their peers, that might be especially detrimental for them because one of the ways that they might feel like they can be their true self is through interacting with somebody via a computer or a screen where there's that extra layer um, between the, the, the individuals that are interacting. And, and so that could, you know, I could, I'm thinking that that could exacerbate the, the very feeling of isolation that we might be trying to, to um, you know, make sure that we're, we're supporting those students with displays. Yes, exactly, totally agree. And then essentially, any monitoring software, whether for discipline or otherwise, is so arguably pointless because then it's not properly gauging because those using it aren't really being their true selves. So it's a waste of both, you know, the, the software, it risks the trust between the students and maybe their school systems. And then of course is a waste of money for the schools purchasing the software. So overall, just not a great choice. Yeah, and we didn't focus on this as much either, but we do see that um, uh, students of color, students from low-income communities, students in rural communities are more likely to rely on school issue devices and be subjected to this monitoring, whereas those more affluent peers who can use their own device can essentially, they have the luxury of opting out. Um, 
so, you know, in our research, you know, we're not able to do like that fine of an analysis, although maybe some point we will be able to, but, you know, uh, back to Lindsay's point about, you know, seeing these, these um, policies have a disproportionate effect on students of color and some of those same dimensions um, that would include students with disabilities. Um, some of these negative effects are more likely to fall to them too. So, so yes, yes to everything, plus one, plus one, plus one. Um, <laughs> And then I think Gabby it was your initial throw to me, which I then took in a different direction where people can go to get more information. Yes, it was. Okay. Um, well, one, I would say Hugh and I are always here and happy to talk about these things. Um, so you can find us. Um, but then there's also information on our website that has a ton more research that we were not able to get into because 45 minutes flies by as this webinar um, presumes, but we are looking at doing um, more research this year. Um, specifically on discipline, sharing data with law enforcement, um, the chilling effect, uh, which you just talked about. And so um, we'd love to hear from you all if there are certain topics or dimensions to this that you think need more research of which I'm sure there are many, because um, we're just in the process of sort of finalizing our approach to that. So, um, and I should have started with this, but thank you Gabby uh, for organizing and, and um, Karen for organizing this webinar. Lindsay, thank you for being um, such a wonderful uh, partner on this webinar, but also just a tireless advocate for students with disabilities. And I really appreciate um, you know, all bringing attention to these issues. Thank you. I'll let Lindsay share for him as well. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Elizabeth and Hugh for, for your work on this survey. I think it really sheds a light uh, uh, on some of the issues that our community is facing. I'd also like to thank Karen and Gabby for organizing this. Uh, you can find us at www.ncld.org. Um, we have some resources there and we'd love to connect with you on, on this issue or other issues impacting students with disabilities. Thank you. And yeah, I'd like to thank all of you. I know, you know, a personal anecdote as a, while neurotypical, a person of color and a person who often had to use school devices to complete assignments, I truly resonate with this discussion. So I wanna thank you all for sharing each of your perspectives. Um, and thank you if you're watching live or if you're watching the recording, I'll make sure to link each of their web pages in the description below, um, as well as ELA's website where you can check out more information, um, especially if you're an educator, we'd love to support you. But yeah, I think that concludes the session for today. So again, thank you all so, so much and we'll see you next time.